Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We are going to do part of the Easter story today. We've been studying Genesis. We are going to uh, leave Genesis behind today. We'll pick up next week with chapter 29. We just finished chapter 28. and But this week we're going to do part of the Easter story. So let's pray and get started. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for the Easter story. If there were no Easter story, there would be no reason to celebrate, no reason to even believe because what would be the use? Because there would be no resurrection. Father, thank you that Jesus was the first, that you raised to eternal life, and that you promised to do the same for your believers. So Lord, help us to look forward to that. Help us to be faithful to the very end, to hang on to the end, Lord, and not to give up hope, not to give out, but to just hold on and to stay faithful, knowing that we have that reward at the end. So Father, bless this story today. Help it to come alive to us. Help us to realize what a price was paid for our salvation, for our eternal life how much you love us, how much the Son loved us, and how much we should love him back in gratitude. So just bless this lesson. Help us to learn and to hide it in our hearts. Forgive us where we fall short. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are going to take part of the Easter story from the Gospel of John today. This is uh, kind of primarily... Um, the Easter story through Mary Magdalene, a little about Mary Magdalene. So um, let's just go ahead and get started. We we have already had Jesus being betrayed. We've had the Lord's Supper. We have them going to the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas betraying Jesus, them coming to get him and take him away, going through the trials, Peter denying him. All of those things have taken place. He's been crucified and he's been laid in the tomb. Nicodemus and had asked for his body. Joseph of Arimathea had a had a tomb. They prepared his body the best they could. It was Friday and and at sundown it was going to start Sabbath and they couldn't do anything like that. So they hurriedly took his body, prepared it the best they could, laid it in the tomb, and then our lesson today begins with Sunday morning, that amazing, wonderful Sunday morning. And so John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They've taken the Lord, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So this lets us know that, that this took place on the first day of the week. Saturday had been the Sabbath. Sunday was the first day of the week on of their Jewish calendar. Last day of the week was Saturday or Sabbath. And they had just finished celebrating Sabbath. Sundown on Saturday ended Sabbath. So it wouldn't have been proper for them to go to the tomb, uh, or for women at least to go to the tomb. So early, early that Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene. Other Gospels uh, refer to other women, but John wants us to know for sure that Mary Magdalene went, that she got up very early that Sunday morning and went to the tomb. Other Gospels tell us that they had taken spices to better prepare his body since it had been hurried by Nicodemus and, and Joseph of Arimathea. So here is, this is where Christians began to worship and use Sunday as their Sabbath instead of Saturday. After the resurrection, gathering on the first day of the week uh, is mentioned in the New Testament. It, in Acts chapter 20, where Paul is there with them, uh, I believe in Philippi, but don't hold me to that. Paul is there with them. He is about to leave for Troas, and uh, he goes to meet them because they're meeting on the first day of the week to break bread together. And he begins to teach, and he teaches till after midnight. I think most of you are familiar with that account. And the young man, um, 
what was his name? Started with a U, an EU. Um, anyway, he falls out of the window during that long and lengthy teaching by Paul. Most of you are familiar and remember that story. But the resurrection on the first day of the week and the gathering of the early Christians on the first day of the week is the basis for our observing the Sabbath on Sunday. Um, there are those who I, I honestly think that is a neat topic, and I and I I plan to research it even more. But um, that would be a topic for some of you who like to just do research on things that are like, hmm, I never thought about that before. This would be one of those good topics for you to research the when and the why and all of that of changing the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Um, there are those who just accept it, never even really thought about it, that uh, even though Sabbath had been on Saturday and Christians, modern day Christians, or early Christians, began to celebrate it on Sunday. And then there are those who struggle with that because there really is not a scripture that tells us to change observing the Sabbath on the last day of the week to the first day of the week. So that would just be one of those things that if you're one of those people that like to do research, that you could do some research and and maybe uh, kind of figure that out in your own mind. Mary Magdalene was a faithful, faithful follower. Jesus, uh, we learn in Luke and Mark both that Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. Some say they think that she had actually been a prostitute prior to meeting Jesus. We, that's not anywhere biblical. But, um, but she had been possessed by seven demons and Jesus cast them out. And so she owed him her life. She followed him faithfully from that point on. Uh, many believe from the the scripture that she probably was a contributor, financial contributor to his uh, ministry. So she had watched Jesus die on the cross. This man that meant so much in her life, this man that gave her life, he meant so much to her. He had, she had watched him die on the cross. She had watched him take him down. She had watched Joseph and Nicodemus take him to the tomb and prepare him and lay him in that tomb and put the rock in front of that tomb. And so now she comes that early Sunday morning and she sees that the stone is rolled away. And so she begins to, um, to run back she didn't walk back. She ran back to tell Peter and John, the disciple who loved Jesus. We know that John refers to himself as that. Uh, scripture refers to him as that. And so we assume, and John, of course, is writing this account. So um, we we specifically know that uh, that that she ran back. I, the little details, we talked about that actually in our Sunday morning uh, Bible study last week at church about the little details. That Sometimes I think we miss the little details and they're important. One of the little details today is that Mary Magdalene is the first that got to see Jesus. She was the first that realized you know, this, this person that had been possessed by demons possibly even lived you know, this super sinful life, but we all have a super sinful life. So, but she was the one that got to be first. It wasn't John, the disciple who Jesus loved. It wasn't Peter, who he designated as the rock. It wasn't even his own mother, who we know he loved. And so those little details are so important. So uh, she finds the empty tomb. She runs back to tell Peter and John that Jesus was not in the tomb. You know, we've talked about the stones. I think that's something that I want to mention just a minute again. These stones were not just, you know, little stones. Often they were carved out of large stones into like a disc shape. And then there would be this trench that was dug in front of the entry into this cave or whatever they were using for their tomb. And then that disc was rolled into that trench and it would fit tightly up against the the entry to that tomb. That way robbers would be much harder for robbers to get in the grave and rob the grave if they thought there was anything in it. Uh, and in this case, if Jesus's followers had wanted to, uh, to rob, to take him out of the grave to claim that he had been resurrected. And 
that closure, that tight closure, also prevented the stench and the smell as that body decomposed from getting out as much. And um, some counts will tell us that they even put the seal, the, that there was that wax seal that sealed the tomb. And so they would know if that seal had been broken if, in case someone tried to uh, disturb the tomb. So anyway, this stone, this he and Matthew tells us it was a very large stone. It was evidently a pretty large tomb because they could walk in around around in it and there were two angels in there and, and that type of thing. So, but Mary had no idea how she, Mary Magdalene, had no idea how she was going to move that stone to anoint the body, to put these spices on the body. She just knew that she was going to the grave that morning. Um, so anyway, probably a single stone that, that sealed that tomb off very, very effectively. And then in John 20, chapter three, uh, verses three through 10. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen laying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Peter and John run to the tomb. They waste no time. They run to the tomb. John beats Peter there. We don't know why. Maybe he's, maybe he's in, in better condition. Maybe he's younger. We don't know for sure, but John beats Peter to the tomb. But he doesn't enter the tomb. He, he peeks inside. The body's gone. He sees the burial linens but he doesn't go in the tomb. Peter gets there and he just barrels into the tomb. No questions, no nothing. He just barrels right into the tomb. Peter was the boisterous one. He's the one who had chopped the ear off the night of the betrayal there in the garden of Gethsemane. He chops the ear off of the priest's attendant. Um, so Peter's always the boisterous one. And, um, they, it was odd for them to run. Adult men didn't run a lot in that culture. But even more than that, they had basically been in seclusion. Probably in the upper room is where we assume maybe that they are, where they had met for the Lord for that last supper. Uh, that might still be where they're hanging together as all of these events have transpired. But their leader has just been crucified. Any one of them could have been next. They were his followers. And they wouldn't want to draw attention to themselves, and yet they ran to the tomb. With no hesitation, they ran to the tomb. So Peter goes in. He sees the linens there, laying there, that it, the strips that he had been wrapped in. And then he sees separately the linen that had been around his head. John had not entered the tomb. John enters the tomb now. He sees the linens laying there, the linens separate that had been wrapped around his head. And it says, finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. He saw and he believed. They knew the scripture. They knew where Zechariah, different ones had, had predicted that he would be killed, but that he would rise again. Jesus himself had said, you know, the temple will be, you'll, you'll destroy the temple, but it'll be rebuilt in three days, referring to his body, to himself. He told his disciples he would be crucified, but they just didn't get it. They just didn't get it. But John got it. John saw those linens. John is in that empty tomb, and John got it. That moment, in that place, on that day, John got it. If it had been robbers, they wouldn't have taken the time to unwrap that body. They would have just taken that body. 
They would have just stolen the body. And they certainly wouldn't have taken time to place them separately where they belonged. I love the explanation that some give that say the body just vacated those grave clothes. The body just came out of those grave clothes. I love the movies Left Behind. If you've never watched those, you need to watch them. The one where where uh, the Lord comes and he, he raptures the believers and some of them are on an airplane and the, it was at night and the people begin to wake up and, and their husband or their family, whoever was sitting next to them, their clothes are there, just laying there, but they're not in them. They just vacated their clothes. We aren't going to need these earthly clothes because we're going to get a robe and a crown. And so I think that's what happened. I think Jesus just vacated his grave clothes. Jesus had tried to teach his disciples. He had tried to tell them, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be crucified, but I'll rise again on the third day. But they just didn't get it. But here in that tomb, John got it. So John and Peter return back to where they were staying, possibly that upper room with the other believers. And so now we go back to Mary Magdalene. Verse 11 through 17 now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking that she was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I'll get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to warn him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So we're back with Mary Magdalene. She evidently uh, went back to the tomb when John and Peter went to the tomb. And when they left, she stayed behind at the tomb. She's seeing this empty tomb, crying her heart out, just crying her eyes out. She doesn't know who or why or where that they've taken Jesus. She looks into the tomb and she sees two angels dressed in white. Evidently, she recognized them as angels. And they ask her, why are you crying? Why are you crying? And she replies to them. She tells them, they've taken my Lord away. Think about that. They've taken my Lord away. Not just my friend, not this guy that I really believed in and was following because I, I really thought he had something going. But he was my Lord. He was my Lord. He saved my life. He cast out demons. He gave me life. He was the Lord of my life. That's why I'm so distraught. That's why I'm crying. He's the one who cast the demons out of me. And so she turns around, and there's another man. And she's still crying. She assumes he's the gardener. She probably doesn't even look all the way up. She just sees him, and she's so distraught and crying. It may still be dark. Back in verse 1, it told us before daylight she had gone to the tomb. And so she doesn't recognize him. And he asks her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And she thinks he's the gardener. And she says, if you've taken him, if you've taken him, please tell me where you've taken him. And I'll get him. I'll collect him. I'll get him. She is totally committed. She wants the body of her Savior. 
She wants to pay those last respects. She wants to know that it's be, being treated with awe and respect. Then Jesus calls her by name and he says, Mary, she knew him immediately. Immediately she knew him. When Jesus calls us by name, do we recognize him? Haven't you felt that? Haven't you felt that? Where he just called you by name and says, you need to do this. You need to say this. Do we recognize him? Or do we just put it off as some feeling that we're having? Physically, Jesus was there. And verbally, he called her name. And she knew immediately who he was. I thought of this scripture in John, I think it's chapter 10, somewhere along in there, where it says, my sheep know my voice, they listen to me and I know them. I thought of that scripture, that's not a very good quote, but I thought of that scripture. We know his voice when we are his sheep. We recognize his voice and he knows us and we follow him. And then Jesus says something that's, that's kind of odd, that, that strikes us sometimes kind of odd. And he says, don't hold on to me. I think some say don't touch me or whatever. Don't hold on to me for I've not yet ascended to the Father. But go tell the others what you've seen. Go tell my brothers, my believers. They are my brothers and sisters in Christ because they believe. Go tell them that I am going to my Father and your Father to my God and to your God. Go tell them that and that you've seen me, physically seen me. We're not exactly sure about this. Um, some say it's because he had not actually ascended yet and he hadn't received his glorified body. Some say it's because they he's trying to prepare her for worshiping him in spirit rather, phys rather than physically. Um, he has been physically in their midst for three and a half years. They've physically been following him. They've physically been learning about him and understanding him and getting to know him. And it's no longer gonna be that physical relationship. It's going to be a spiritual relationship. We identify with that because our relationship with him is spiritual. And so adjust to learning to have that physical relationship removed, but grow strong in that spiritual relationship. So go and tell my brothers that you have seen me. I am alive, that you've seen me. But be adjusting to that physical, away from the physical into that, that spiritual relationship. That's how we know him. But those witnesses of his physical presence are so important to us so important to our faith. They saw him. They knew that he was dead. They knew he had been in that tomb for three days. They watched him die. And believe you me, the Roman soldiers didn't make a mistake about that. Jesus told us when he died, it's finished. To tell us die, it's finished. I'm done. I'm going to the Father. And so for them to see him in the physical state was proof of all the things that he had taught them, that they would have eternal life, that they too would be raised from the dead because they believed they, they no longer face death eternal, they face eternal life. And so their seeing him is so important to our faith. It gives us that hope. It gives us that promise. Yes, there were others who were raised from the dead. Lazarus, we know Lazarus was raised from the dead. We know the centurion's daughter was raised from the dead. We know the widow's son was raised from the dead. I probably forgotten some. They were raised from the dead, but they were raised back into this life and they would die again. Jesus was raised from e to eternal life to never die again, to spend eternity with the Father. And one day we will spend eternity with him. 
we will spend eternity with the Father, with the God that he said, I'm going to my Father and your Father, my God and your God, and I will be in his presence. Of course, he walked on this earth for a while. He had many witnesses that saw him, and then the disciples got to see him ascend into heaven. They got to see him ascend. He gave them their commission. He gave us that same commission to go into all the world and tell them about him so that they too would have eternal life. And they're gazing up when he ascended into heaven. And the angel says, why are you standing here looking up into heaven? Because he's going to come back the same way that he left us. We've been studying Revelation in our ladies' Bible study. He's coming back. He, he rose. That's our promise. This is Super Bowl Sunday, as our pastor calls it for Christians, because he arose. But even better, he's coming back, and we are going to meet him in that same state of being and spend eternity with him and with God. Wow. All I can say is wow. If we believed that so deeply, we would be looking forward to leaving this life and entering eternal life. I hope you have a blessed Easter. We will pick up in chapter 29 next week of Genesis and then go on to continue that study the rest of this month and into May. But have a blessed Easter. Think about that resurrection. And we too are going to do that. Thank you.